Um, my name is Brother Torrance. Happy Sabbath to everyone. All right. Uh, the, today's title of the lesson is The Mystery of Godliness. The Mystery of Godliness. And uh, I'm going to put the lesson in context starting from a scripture. It's not in the lesson, but it's a good way to put it in the context that Paul wrote in Romans, the 10th chapter. He said, how then, can they call in, can, how, they, how then can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And that's the big piece right there. How can they hear without a preacher? Especially a preacher that's sent from God. That's what your preacher has to be. A preacher that's sent from the Lord. And that's why the world is in the condition it's in now. Because in the forefront of what we call Christianity, it's a lot of false preachers. A lot of false prophets and a lot of false teachers and they teach it for doctrine the commandments of men, not teaching people how to fear God and keep his commandments, as which we just read. That's the whole duty of man. And Paul ran into this when he was in Athens. He was waiting for Paul. He was waiting for Timothy. And he was waiting for Silas. And he was, he was, he was sitting around in Athens. And he was seeing the same things that we see in the conditions that we see in nowadays. People just lost. So we're going to pick this up in Acts, the 17th chapter. We're going to pick this up in Acts 17th chapter because... That's the way the world is. The preachers out here are not feeding the people what thus say the Lord. So the people out here are believing anything. They don't have no fear of the true and living God. They don't even know who the true and living God is. They don't know who he was before he came in the flesh. They don't even know how he manifested himself in the flesh. And if your preacher was sent from God, you would know these things. You would even know the time of his reward. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through these different points that I just outlined. And then at the end of this lesson, I'm sure you'll have a firm understanding of who God was, how he came, and who he is. So Acts 17, and we're going to pick this up at verse 16. Acts 17, and pick it up at verse 16. You can go ahead and read. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And so that's the condition we're in nowadays, pretty much. This whole world is given to idolatry. They don't know what they want to serve. They don't know whether they want to serve the God of Sunday. They don't know if they want to call on one of the old Greek pagan gods. Go ahead. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that that met with him. And so his first competition or his first conversation is with the Jews, right? And with the devout people that was in the marketplace. He, he said that if they, they disputed with them daily. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, right? So they're disputing with these people because these people that was in that same area was caught up in paganism, false doctrine. And we're going to see that. Verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Now, see, these Epicureans and these Stoics are people who, who they believed in a lot of things Alexander the Great had rooted in that culture. And so these Epicureans and these Stoics are people who believe in the same thing. You know, some of the pagan beliefs and the philosophy that Alexander the Great or a lot of Gentile people uh, who they, what they do believe in. You know, instead of going into the Bible and find out what thus say the Lord, They'll rather say the, the universe, or you'll start hearing terms like that, or the powers that be, or things like that, instead of saying the true and living God, or the God of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So that's who these Epicureans and these Stoics were, and that's who encountered Paul. And what did they say? And some said, what will this babbler say? Uh-huh. Others, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. See, they had never heard on Jesus. They never heard about Jesus. And so Paul, when he came talking, they called him a babbler. And then they say he's supposed, he may be setting forth, uh, uh, he seems to be somebody that's going to set forth conversation about a strange God. Well, to them, Jesus was a strange God. And these Gentiles never even heard about the resurrection, so they don't even know what they're working for. Mm -hmm. Skip down to verse 22. Go ahead and read. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. I come out here and I see the whole, the whole city given to idolatry. You're dealing with philosophy. Mm -hmm. So he said, I seem that in all things you are too superstitious by what means? What did he see in verse 23? 
For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. And that's what we're going to do today, sisters and brothers. We're going to declare the unknown God. Like we opened up and put in context, how are you going to call on him and whom you don't even know who you're calling on? You don't know who you believe in. How are you going to believe in somebody you have never heard of? And that's why they were in the condition that they were in. That's why they had an inscription to an unknown God, because they had never heard of him. So Paul said, him, I'm going to declare unto you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into John, the first chapter, and we're going to build from there. And what I'm going to do is declare what Paul was declaring unto them Gentiles, the unknown God. It's a mystery to this world, but when you get out of here today, you're going to understand clearly who God was. So let's pick this up in John, the first chapter. That's what we're going to build from. John 1, and we're going to drop off, we're going to start off at verse 18. John 1 and verse 18. You can go ahead when you get there and read, brother. No man have seen God at any time. So how absolute is no man? It's absolute, right? Absolute. No man have seen God at any time. Go ahead. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus declared the Father unto us. That's who he came to orient us back to, the Father. All right? But it says no man hath seen God. So if I was a New Testament Christian and I read this, but I breezed through the Old Testament, I have a conflict a little bit, right? Because yeah. no man hath seen God. But we're going to go into Exodus 24th chapter and kind of uh, qualify that statement. No man hath seen God. So let's go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Because that's a big statement to say no man hath seen God. Because once you read this, you should have a question that pop up in your head. Exodus 24, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead and read. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. So this is the Lord talking to Moses, and he said, Come up, you Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy other elders. So we got seventy-four people that the Lord requested to come up to worship, right? Skip down to verse 9. Go ahead and read. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. Wait a minute. We just read no man hath seen God, right? Mm -hmm. But we just see 74 individuals. They saw the God of Israel. Go ahead. And there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone. So they saw what was under his feet, right? Yeah, yeah. So they see God. They see his feet. Go ahead. And as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. Uh-huh. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. So we just read no man have seen God. But then 74 people saw God and they did eat and drink. But a lot of people will have the conclusion of uh, uh, in, in Christendom that this was the God of the Old Testament. This was the father. Right. But let's go walk this down because maybe it wasn't the father. Let's go to John, the fifth chapter, because a lot of people got in their mind that the God of the Old Testament was the Father, and the God of the New Testament is the Son. But we're going to see what Jesus say. So we're going to go to John 5, because we just read no man have seen God, but then we got a conflict with 74 individuals saw God. So now we got to walk this down and figure this out. Was this the Father? which most people would say. John 5, you're going to pick it up at verse 33. John 5, and hit verse 33. Go ahead and read. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. That's what John was supposed to do. He came to make way. So John was supposed to bear witness to the truth. He was coming to make way in the streets and tell people about Jesus coming. Go ahead to verse 36. But I received not text. Oh, 36. 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. Uh -huh. So this is Jesus saying, I got a greater witness than that of John. Go ahead. For the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works that I do. Uh huh. Bear witness of me that the Father have sent me. So you should have known who I was because John knew who I was. That's why he bared witness of me, right? 
So the works that I do, if you'd have read the Old Testament, you would have understood, because that's the only thing they had at that time was the Old Testament. So if they would have read the old book, they would have saw the works, and then they would have understood who, who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, to verse, keep on going to verse 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. So the Father bear witness of Jesus. Go ahead. You have neither heard his voice at any time. So you never heard the Father's voice at any time? Nor seen his shape. So who that was in the old book then, sisters and brothers? It couldn't have been the Father, because Jesus is clearly saying that you have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So now we understand that Moses and them was dealing with Jesus in the old book, right? Not the Father. You have neither heard his voice any time, no seen his shape. So now we understand that that was Jesus. Let's go substantiate this fact. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Because some people, like the book say, by the mouth of two or more witnesses, let a fact be established. And some people need three witnesses to make a fact established. We're going to have plenty of witnesses today. And like I said, before you leave out of here, you're going to understand who Jesus was, how he came, and what he came to do. 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. When you get there, you can go ahead and read. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Uh-huh. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So let's pay attention to that. All our fathers were under the cloud. We're going to hang our coat on that rack right there so we can make sure that we tie something together with that. <clears throat> but we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. At the time, they were baptized unto Moses because he was the intercessor. But Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father right now, so he's the intercessor for us. So we baptize in the name of Jesus. So keep on going. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Uh-huh. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So it's telling us now that they drank all the same spiritual drink and ate all the same spiritual meat. And that rock that they followed was following them was Christ. But that says that how the, all our fathers was under the cloud, right? So now let's go back in the old book and see who was in the cloud at the time when our fathers was passing through the sea. Let's go into Exodus, the 13th chapter, and bring that to table, put a table so we can eat on it. Exodus 13. Exodus 13. We're going to pick it up at verse 17. Because it said that rock that followed them was Christ, sisters and brothers. So we already have substantiated the fact that Christ was he who was, Moses, who, who was the God that Moses was dealing with in the old book. But like I said, by the mouth of more than one witness, it's a fact established. So let's go to Exodus 13. We're going to pick it up at verse 17. And let's see who was in that cloud. Go ahead, verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, uh -huh. that, that God let them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. And that's when Israel just got sprung out of captivity, right, from the Egyptians. So they were slaves. They were, were slaves and they had a slave mentality. So when you have a slave mentality, you can be controlled a little bit better with that weakness. That's a weak mentality, actually. So that's what the Lord said. These guys ain't ready for fighting. All right, I'm going to lead them around this way. We ain't going to go through the land of Philistines because they see these cats. They're going to return to Egypt. Go ahead. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Uh-huh. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So I hope y'all paying attention to what it's saying. It said they were led by God. God led them. God said, and he said, God led the people through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Skip down to verse 21. Go ahead and read. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. So that per the, the, the God that was under the cloud that all our fathers had passed through the Red Sea with was the same God that went before them in a pillar of cloud, right? Mm -hmm. It said the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. Go ahead. To lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. So God led them. Christ led them. He went before them in the pillar of cloud. He led them through the Red Sea. 
God told them to go through the way, not by the way of the Philistines. But this same God was Christ. Christ. It wasn't the God of the Old Testament, which people would think it's the Father. We have never seen the Father, never heard his voice, and won't see the Father or hear his voice in his flesh and blood body. That's just the end of that conversation, because when we see the Father, we should all be God. And that's when God will deliver up all of us at the same time. None of them that died before us are going to get the reward before us. We're going to all get it at the same time. So let's go over to Isaiah, the 48th chapter, because say God led them. Christ went before them in the clouds. And let's go see what else Isaiah, the 48th chapter, has to say. Isaiah 48, and we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Because this is the Lord speaking through the mouth of Isaiah. A lot of the times the Lord spoke through the mouth of his prophets. And if you don't see red, you have to pay attention to the tenor of the conversation so that you can understand who's speaking and then who he's speaking to. So 48 and 12, Isaiah 48 and 12, you can go ahead and read. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my call. Which is one and the same. Israel and Jacob is one and the same. Go ahead. I am he. Uh huh. I am the first. I also am the last. So the Lord is telling you right here, I am he. I'm the first God you ever dealt with, and I'm going to be the last God you're going to ever deal with. So you, the God of the Old Testament was the first God. That was what Moses and Abraham and all our forefathers had dealt with. And then the last God, before we get delivered up to the Father, is going to be the same God we've been dealing with in his flesh and blood. Go ahead. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. So we learning some more things. He said, his, so this same God, he said his hands laid the foundation of the earth. Go ahead. And my right hand hath spanned the heavens. So when we read in Genesis, when it said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we know what God did that. The same God that led Moses and them through the cloud. The same God that helped them go out where the, where the Philistines. The same God that led the people. Our forefathers in the days of the old, it's the same God that when Genesis had it written, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, it's the same God. Because he said, my hand also have laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand have spanned the heavens. Skip down to verse 13, I mean verse 16. Go ahead and read. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this, Uh I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. Uh From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. So he said, I haven't spoken in secret from the beginning. We have to pay attention to the tenor of the conversation when you're reading it from the beginning. When it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you have to keep on reading to find out who that God was. So he he hasn't spoken in secret from the beginning. He said, and now the Lord God, which is the Father, and his Spirit have sent me. Now let's go pick him up in Isaiah the seventh chapter. Bag it up, and we're going to walk it down. Isaiah 7, because he said the Lord God and his Spirit have sent him. So let's go see this God, and let's go see the sign he's going to give of his coming. Isaiah 7, and you can pick it up at verse 10. Isaiah 7, you can pick it up at verse 10. Because it wasn't no secret when Jesus came, sisters and brothers. It just wasn't identified because people just didn't read, just like they do nowadays. So the sign that he gave of his coming, that he was the Christ or the Messiah, the world should, never, should not have missed it, but it went past them like a speeding bullet. Pick it up at verse 10. Go ahead and read. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, uh-huh. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or, or in the height above. So the Lord is telling Ahaz, he said, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, because I want to make sure that you understand who you're dealing with. So he said, Ask thee a sign. But Ahaz had enough understanding to know that the evil and adulterous generation seek after signs. So Ahaz said something that was wisdom. What was his reply? But it has said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Because you ain't going to tempt the Lord because I know already. Mm. The Lord know my thought. He know I know who you are, so I don't need a sign. What else he say? Go ahead. 
And he said, hear ye now, O house of David. Uh-huh. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? Uh-huh. But will ye weary my God also? When asking these signs, would you weary God also? Go ahead. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. So speaking through the mouth of Isaiah again, he said, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The Lord's going to give you a sign. That, will, that way you cannot ignore it. What's mm. the sign? Behold, a virgin shall conceive uh -huh. and bear a son, and his name shall be in his name and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so now, the word Emmanuel means God with us. So when this virgin have a baby, right, when the virgin conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, in fact, God would be with man. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. So this sign, he was telling Ahaz to tell the people that when y'all see this sign, y'all gonna know that this baby is the Messiah. This baby is is Christ. This baby will be called the anointed one when he become a man. He had to go through the same way we had to go through in coming to the man's family as well. He had to be birthed through a woman. Psalms 139 said he was hid in his mother's womb. So this body was prepared for him and I'm not going to go too much farther than that so I don't give away the lesson. So let's go ahead and find this child. Let's go to Matthew the first chapter. Because sometimes I get ahead of myself, <laughs> and I start telling the lesson, and I start taking out the punches that I need to hold fast <laughs> till y'all get out of here at 4 o'clock. Matthew 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 18, because we shouldn't have missed that sign. Matthew 1 and verse 18. Go ahead and read. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Uh-huh. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I like pulling out little things on the way to, 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 uh, to, to understand it. He said, the birth of Jesus was on this way when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together. Pay attention to those small little nuances of the scriptures. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Go ahead. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Now, Joseph was a just man because any man, any brother in this day and age know if my wife or, you know, my significant other came home with a child that uh, we ain't came together, then we might have a problem. It don't seem too copacetic to live with a woman that had a, this was pregnant and I ain't touch you. So I got to question that. But Joseph, being a just man, he was not willing to make her a public example. He was mad to put her away privately. Go ahead. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, uh -huh. saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife. Uh -huh. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the angel had to come and stop Joseph and say, hold on. This is a little bit above your pay grade right here, brother. Your girl, gonna ha your wife going to have a child and it's a child of the holy ghost that's how she's going to the book the book like i said the body was prepared for jesus in heaven it was put in mary but joseph couldn't put that together in his mind so it was a little bit above his pay grade so the angel had to come to him and break it all down for him and what else did he say and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name jesus and the name came from heaven that men on this earth is disputing over Jesus. They, the name through time get transliterated, sisters and brothers, and we understand that. Through just words, and, and words change. You know, you got thou and thee in the book, but we say the. Mm. We say yet, and we say still. So things change over time. So this name that they argued over came from heaven, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And what did he come to do? For he shall save his people from their sins. Uh-huh. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, uh -huh. saying, yep. Behold, a virgin shall, shall be with child. So all this was done so we could revert right back to what we just read in Isaiah the seventh chapter. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son. Uh -huh. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So when y'all saw this, when, 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 when Mary actually had this child, the prophecy has been fulfilled. This is the testimony of it. A, 
A virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. When this baby comes forth, God indeed was with us. And Paul understood this, and that's why he wrote this in 1 Timothy, the third chapter. So we're going to go over to 1 Timothy, the third chapter. Because did nobody understand that God was being manifested in the flesh? That was the only way he could have came and saved man from their sins. Because man's sin and the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take it away. So a man had to die. And when the Lord looked down here on the earth, he didn't see a man that was righteous enough to die for the sins of the world. And that's the mystery of it all. That God had to come through a woman that was a virgin. And like I said, Paul understood this in 1 Timothy, the third chapter. So we had some brothers that always had their eyes on as they was reading these scriptures. And so when the Messiah popped up, it wasn't no mistake. It wasn't no mystery to them. All right. 1 Timothy 3. And we're going to pick it up at verse 16. One scripture, 1 Timothy 3. At verse six, uh, ver- uh, First Timothy three and sixteen. Go ahead and read. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Uh huh. God was manifested in the flesh. So that's why it's a mystery, because God was manifested in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Uh huh. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. Uh huh. Believed on in the world, received up into glory. These are the things that God did: manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles. The woman at Samaria was one of them. The apostles were sent to the Gentiles. That was another. When they came up under the new covenant, believed on in the world. That's what we are. Mm-hmm. We believers. We Christians. We followers of Christ. And then he was received up into glory. The St. Psalms said that he's sitting on the right hand of the Father until his enemies made his footstool. So that's what he's there. That's why it's a mystery. But Paul understood that. Let's go into John, the first chapter. So now we can understand what it's referring to when it's called the Word. John, the first chapter. It shouldn't be a mystery to the true believers of, Lord, of, of, of God because we have both testaments. We have the old and we have the new. So it ain't no mystery to us. But it's still a mystery to those who fall under what we opened up with, where their preacher I teach it for doctrine, the commandments of men. They're not teaching people who God was. They don't even understand who God was. So they get a sermon, and they take one verse out of the sermon, and they preach about that one scripture for an hour. Then they pass the tide and play it around about four or five more times before that <laughs> class is over with. So if you go to class with $100, you're going to leave with zero. You go to one of the first day of the week churches. Yeah. John 1. So now we can understand this mystery. John 1 and 1. Go ahead and read. In the beginning was the Word. Uh Uh-huh. And the Word was with God. Uh Uh-huh. And the Word was God. So in the beginning was the Word. This is another thing we can clear up. That oneness theology. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. How many people do y'all see in this conversation right here? Two individuals. You got the Word. And he was with God. So the one is theology is another form of false doctrine because they can't get in their mind that it's a Godhead. And that's what we're going to get into the family of God if we be so blessed. Go ahead. The same was in the beginning with God. Uh huh. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So it's not going to continuously say all things were made by him and he didn't create the world. We just read it a couple of times already. So these witnesses are making this thing. It's a fact. All things were made by who the book called the word. Who is a mystery to the people because they can't understand that the word, which was God, was manifested in the flesh. It's that simple. But we saw who that God was, who we were dealing with in the old book, who was said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. The same God that created the heavens and the earth was manifested in the flesh. Skip down to verse 10. Go ahead and read. He was in the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Just like it is today. He's not in the world no more. But the world still was made by him. And this world just don't know who he is. It's too hard for some people to get into this book and sit down and spend some time to read. 
if your salvation is dependent on you just reading and understanding what we opened up with, with the commandments, you can get salvation. That's just how simple it is. But people don't want to sit here and read. They'd rather be told from their pastor how to get salvation. And the first thing they pastor tell you is, the Lord loved everybody, and he died for all our sins. We don't have to do any work, and when we die, we're going to be with him in heaven. <laughs> that sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> that sounds like something we should see on Nickelodeon. <laughs> Seriously. I look at their gods. You know who their gods are? Shazam and all of them other. I'm not playing. That's the imagination of their mind. That's their god. Thor, Shazam, these Greek gods that we didn't pull it into our our culture from the Greek uh, 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 culture. And now we up under this Roman culture, and we still hold on, but they put a cross over every church, and that's their God. But then they got so much no, enough nerve to put an image of a man on it to say, well, we killed y'all, God. And that's some cold-blooded stuff. And our people still go to their churches every single Sunday and get their pastor's money. That's why he's still a mystery. Go ahead to verse 13. Which were born not of blood. So this was God. He wasn't <laughs> born of blood. Nor of the, or of the will of the flesh. So it wasn't like <clears throat> he had to have a physical seed. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Nor of the will of man. And it wasn't like Mary and Joseph had to come together on a date night mm -hmm. and have Jesus. This is a spiritual thing. This is all about God showing the world, number one, his power, but number two, giving you something that you got to believe on that most of the world would not believe on. And it sounds like it could be troubling in a practical manner, if you're thinking about it, that God that created all things came down here and he was just like me and you. That sounds unreasonable to a non-believer, but that's what faith is about. If you got faith in all the things that the book say, then why wouldn't you believe that God could come down here in the flesh? He said he could raise up stones to Abraham, right? Yeah. Make, raise up the, uh, stones to Abraham and make seed out of, out of stones. But, they, they, but they, they limit the hand of God with their beliefs because they can't think outside the box of how powerful God is. So he wasn't born of blood or the will of flesh nor the will of man, verse 14, but of God. And the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. We ain't gonna keep, we kept on, we keep on reading. Mm. The word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. Yes, sir. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the, the word said, I chose a people. So I'm gonna go hang around them people that I chose so that I can jumpstart them and get them on the ball, because this people that I chose is a peculiar people, and I want to use them to put forth my word. Who better would he have chose? I mean, I can't say who better, because I'm not going to put us above no other person, but Israel really know how to orate. Israel really know how to talk. Israel got gang. That's what we call it in the street. <laughs> so that's what it is. He chose us. He chose us to bring forth this word, to tell the world about him. And he dwelt among us. And he said he was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Now let's go into Hebrews. Let's go into Hebrews and see why. Why was he manifested in the flesh? Hebrews, the second chapter. I'm sorry. I left y'all behind real quick. Apologize for that. Hebrews 2. We're going here for one scripture. Verse 9. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. When you get there, you can go ahead and read, brother. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So that God that was manifested in the flesh just got a name, right? Mm -hmm. It say we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, because angels cannot die for the suffering of death. So that's why he came, because man sinned, and it took a clean man to take away the sins of all men. So it's not just the sins of Israel. It's not just the sins of the Jews. It's the sins of all those who call on the Lord in spirit and in truth. 
So he said, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, cr- go ahead. Crowned with glory and honor. Uh huh. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That he, by the grace of God, this grace is extended to everybody. And all we have to do is find out what we need to do to get it, to get salvation, to stay up under the grace. Because grace is a free gift, and it's retained by keeping God's commandments. Because we read it in the last book, in the last book of the book, Revelation 22. Mm-hmm. Blessed are those that keep my commandments. So if that's the last book, you can close the book after that. Just keep the commandments and you will be blessed. So he said that God was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's why he came, sisters and brothers, to die. And who did he come to? Let's go pick it up in Genesis 22nd chapter. Genesis 22, going to walk it down. Because he could have chose anybody. He could have chose the sons of Japheth. He could have chose the sons of Ham. But let's see whose son of Noah he did choose. Genesis 22. And pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 22. Pick it up at verse 1. When you go, when you get there, you can go ahead and read. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. So now God had to go tempt Abraham because everybody who's called a servant is going to get tried. We're not going to get this salvation or we're not going to get this eternal life without going through some trials and some tribulations. It's not all sweet when you're over here serving Jesus because everybody's going to be against you, even those of your own household. So when you turn to the true and living God, you got to be ready to fight this fight of faith and you got to be ready to endure all the way to the end. So this is the same thing he had to put in front of Abraham. He had to give him a test. Go ahead, verse 2. And he said, Take now of thy son, thine only son Isaac, uh-huh. whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. Now, the Lord already told Abraham he was going to have Isaac, and he already told Isaac, I mean, he already told Abraham what Isaac was going to be. Mm-hmm. But he still had to test him because Abraham still had to make a choice. And people want to put um, uh, that like, like you don't have choices to make. Like, yes, you have salvation. Yes, your name could be written in the book today, but if you make the bad choice tomorrow, your name could get blotted out the book. So you have to walk this walk every single day until the end, either the end of your life or the end of the creation as we know it. So said, you have to make a choice. Abraham could have chose not to kill his son Isaac, right? But let's see what he did. Let's go down to verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Uh And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on on the altar upon the wood. Now Isaac wasn't a foolish son because as they going up there, Isaac started paying attention to everything that was going on around him. Like, hold on, Dad. I I see the wood. I see the altar. But where's the sacrifice? Because, uh, I'm only here with you. <laughs> so, uh, all right, we're going to go, go along with this. Isaac was a rebellious. Go ahead to verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So this is some, to me, personally, having a son, I would have to say that was a very big test to overcome. Because if you got to put, and I'm just saying that from a male's perspective, but I know females can say the same thing. Because y'all better children. Y'all haven't mean you got your bellies for nine months. Then you go through all the pains. And so both of us have uh, kind of joint interest in that. But a male killing his first, his son, not, not his firstborn, because Ishmael, as we know mm-hmm. through the scriptures, that that was really his firstborn, but that wasn't the son of the covenant. And so God is a covenant God. God dealt with Abraham. He made a covenant with Isaac. And that covenant went through Jacob, whose now name is called Israel. And who we are called, that's what we call ourselves Hebrew Israelites because Abraham's name originally, I mean, Abraham was called Hebrew back, I think it's like Genesis 10th chapter or something. Abraham the Hebrew before he went and knocked off Solomon and Gomorrah. So long story short, Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the night to slay his son. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. 
And he said, here am I. So the guy got his hand up in the air and was ready to cut his son's throat. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven at the right time and told him, Abraham, Abraham, here am I. Go ahead. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Lay not your hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. Uh huh. For now I know that thou fears God. Because you still have to make the choice. It's not that God don't know things. It's not that God don't know all things, but God know all prophecy. I can say that for sure. And Abraham could have made a decision not to kill Isaac, and that part would have not came through for the Lord to say, now I know. He has to put you through a test to know that you are his servant, period. It wouldn't be fair to give any one of us a cakewalk, and we turned ourselves against him. He didn't turn from us. So in order for us to get back to him, we're going to go bumping our heads all the way into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He said the righteous going to be scarcely saved. And I know I'm going to be on that part of prophecy because scarcely, because I bumped my head too. The only flesh and blood and all these things that go on in the world are snares that the devil set for us in little traps. And sometimes we fall in them. But the book said the righteous man falls seven times and he get back up. So if you fall, don't fall off. You know, don't be like somebody that I know. Just don't fall off. Keep on fighting. Go ahead. Verse 13, where we at? That was 12, verse uh-huh. 15. I'm sorry. For Skip down to verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time. Uh-huh. And he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. So the Lord said, by myself have I sworn, because you putting in some work. Mm. You showing me that you got my best interest in hand. You showing me that you believe me. You showing me you got faith. So because you did this, I can't swear by nobody bigger than this. By myself have I sworn. He said that thou, because thou hast done that thing, and that's not what tell thy son, thy only son, that in blessed I'm going bless thee, and in multiply I'm multiply thee. Because Abraham did something that the father did. He gave up his only begotten son. That's what the book said, right? Mm-hmm. So he gave up his only begotten son. That was a faithful act, Abraham, because you gave, you give, you was willing to sacrifice your only son of the covenant. Go ahead. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. Uh-huh. And as the sand which is upon the seashore. Uh-huh. And thy, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And we're going here for verse 18, because this is a very important verse. Go ahead. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. And he's not talking about multiple seeds. He's talking about one, even Jesus, right? He said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, this is in Genesis, and he's extending salvation out to the whole world before the new covenant even came into place. Mm -hmm. This is talking about salvation for everybody. And people of the Hebrew persuasion (laughs) will believe you to believe that it's only salvation for Israel. But he stood up here, and he just said from Genesis, all the nations. Israel is only one. Let's keep that in mind. Is that it? All all that? Okay. So now, we see that all nations of the earth can be blessed in the sea. Let's go bring this child. Let's go run him down. Let's go to Isaiah, the ninth chapter. Because this is our future king that's about to be born. And all the nations of the earth can be blessed in him. Let's see what they say about him. Isaiah 9. Isaiah, the Lord spoke by the mouth of Isaiah a lot. He spoke by the mouth of all his prophets, honestly. You can go on any of his prophets and find out who God is, who God was, and what he come to do. It's not a prophet that he did not show, because it's different books and people fall in love with different writers. But the Lord spoke by the mouth of a lot of his prophets, and even, even David in Psalms. Isaiah 9, and we're going to pick it up at verse 6. Let's go pick up this seed. Isaiah 9, pick it up at verse 6. You can go ahead and read. For unto us a child is born, Uh unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Look at these titles, Wonderful. Counselor. Uh Uh-huh. The Mighty God. The Mighty God. So this child is going to be called the Mighty God. Go ahead. The Everlasting Father. The only father that we know, Mm -hmm. man, the Everlasting Father, 
the prince of peace. That's right. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. People pay attention to that. We're talking salvation. We're talking everlasting life. He said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. You can't get around that. So people should have had a light bulb go off in their head when they seen that. If there's no end, then what's after that when we die? But you got to keep on reading. That's yeah. another lesson. Go ahead. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom uh -huh. to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. So we want to put our nail in the term upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. Because it was only one person that was promised the throne of David. And we're going to go see who that was. Let's go to Luke, the first chapter. Upon the throne of David, this child shall sit. And it was only one individual that was promised the throne of David. Luke 1 and 26. Luke 1 and 26. You can go ahead and read. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Uh-huh. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So the angel had to go to Joseph first. Then he went to Mary. And it had to be on one accord. So he made sure he told Joseph. And I know he had to tell Mary because Mary would have started growing in her stomach and would have started thinking something was up. <laughs> yeah. Joseph, was you messing with me last <laughs> night? <laughs> you know, but the angel had to go and bring both of them up to speed. Because like I said, this was something that was big. That's why the Lord said the Lord himself shall give you a sign that this virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Jesus. Verse 30, skip down to verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Uh huh. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And because Mary found favor because she was keeping the commandments, that's how you going to find favor with God, right? Yes. Yeah. She was blessed enough to have the Messiah, right? She said, he said, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. What else? He shall be great. He shall be great. And shall be called the son of the highest. Only God higher than Jesus is the father. Mm -hmm. So he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's what we just read in Genesis, right? I mean, I'm sorry, in Isaiah. That he going to sit upon the throne of David. So he said, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Go ahead. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Uh-huh. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So he's going to establish everlasting life when he does come. Like I say, he's our future king. So he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Go ahead. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? How am I going to have a child and I'm a virgin? So how is this going to be, and I have not known a man? What did the angel say? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, uh -huh. and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the angel answered her and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. There had to be a spiritual thing going on if this woman was going to have a child without having any intercourse with a male. Because how we know life nowadays, well, what man would call nowadays if that happened is in what they call it artificial insemination. But that's not what Jesus did because Jesus didn't have to have the seed mm -hmm. from Abraham, I mean, from David. This was a spiritual thing. That's why the body was prepared in heaven for him, right? And the angel just took the body overshadowed Mary and he said this holy thing should be put in you and shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. So let's go park, park ourselves right there on that topic. The baby that was going to be born of Mary was going to be called the son of God and let's go see who else 
was born like unto the Son of God. Hebrews, the seventh chapter. We're going to pick this up at verse 1. Because this all connects. Hebrews 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. That's why the Lord said you shouldn't miss me. That's why he had to come and jumpstart his people because he couldn't believe that they missed that virgin birth. Mm -hmm. Like, how did y'all miss that? That should have been word spread abroad. But nope. Sometimes when we was going through those captivities and up under all those different rulers and, and kings, we had lost sight of who we were. We lost sight of our doctrine, uh, the, the, the Lord's doctrine, but, you know, our belief system. We lost sight of it, and we started kind of intermingling with, you know, uh, the, the, the philosophers and the people. That's why Paul ran into them Epicureans, and, but he was amongst the Jews too, though. Yeah. So you see, the Jews was getting caught up in that stuff, and so that's why they didn't see it. But we're going to stay to the point. It said, what were we at? It said, the Lord God should get the front of the and he should be called the Son of God. Now, let's go see who this person is that we're bringing into the conversation now. Hebrews 7 and 1. Go ahead and read. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. That's king of Salem, king of Jerusalem. Go ahead. Priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So this is the person who met Abraham after he came back from getting lot from among, you know, the homosexuals. Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. So, all right. Go ahead. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Uh-huh. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. We read that that would be one of his titles, right? This is calling him a king because mm -hmm. he is king of peace. But it said Abraham gave a tenth part to this gentleman, Melchizedek, right? Let's, let's, let's go run down some of his credentials. Verse 3. Without father. Without father. Without mother. Uh-huh. Without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the Son of God. He was way like unto who? The Son of God. But we just seen that the major came to Mary and told her her son, who was called Jesus, was going to be called the Son of God. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. So Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God because before Jesus came in the flesh, guess who he was? Melchizedek. Absolutely. So now we got Melchizedek back there with Abraham. That was before Moses. But the God that led Moses them through the cloud was the same God that was called Christ. It's coming together now, Mr. Page. That's my last name, by the way, so y'all don't think I'm talking to somebody else. <laughs> it's coming together now. This Melchizedek didn't have a father or mother because Jesus didn't have a father or mother physically. It was a spiritual birth. Melchizedek didn't have a beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. Let's go see who else is a priest, because you cannot have two priests, sisters and brothers. Let's go on to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Let's bag it up a little bit, because Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. Mary's son, Jesus, was going to be called the Son of God, and both of them have the same resume. But let's see, Hebrews 4. Let's pick it up at verse 14. Hebrews 4. And let's pick it up at verse 14 and see who this priest is. Go ahead and read. 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. So I thought Melchizedek was the high priest. Mm -hmm. uh, continually. continually. That's what the book said, right? Yeah. But we say, seeing then we have a great high priest. Go ahead. That is passing to the heavens. Uh-huh. Jesus, the Son of God. Oh, so now we got a connection that Jesus is the high priest, Melchizedek is the high priest, but you can only have one. So when Jesus came in the flesh, he hung up his priesthood. He's the only person that's going to come as a priest and a king. So he hung up his priesthood, came down here to die for the sins of man, and then when he went back on the, south, the, the right hand of the Father, he picked up his priesthood back up. That's why he instituted Levi, because he had to have some priests to go forth and take care of the sacrifices and all this stuff because he already had the plan because he caught the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he already knew I have to institute something because a lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. 
So I have to institute something, but the blood of the bulls and goats can't take away sin. This is a stopgap to the one who comes can really take away sin. So when he was on the, th- he was on the throne, that's who he was. Where we at? Uh, I'm sorry. Middle of 14. Middle, okay, go ahead. Let me start it over. Stop, yeah, stop back at the top. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, uh-huh. let us hold fast our profession. Uh-huh. For we have an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He said, we have, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in the flesh just like we are. So he had to go through the same emotions. He had angers. He had the same things that men go through nowadays, the same things that women can attest to because we are human beings, right? So he was touched with the same infirmities. Why? Go ahead. But was in all points tempted like as we, we are, yet without sin. Absolutely, because he, would have, he had to be a righteous sacrifice. So he had to be without sin. So what is it being told? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. So that's it. We got Melchi- So we got Jesus, who was called the high priest, the son of God, and he had to come in the flesh just like John the first chapter said. So that he could be touched with the same infirmities that we go through, so that when we go do, when we do pray to him, he can say, Father, give him a little time, give him a little room, give him a little more grace. Because they flesh and they blood, and I know how hard that flesh and blood is to get through. Because Satan got all these snares and these traps out here for us to get caught up in. The world is wicked, and it's probably more wicked than it's ever been that my eyes have seen. And it says in the, it's going to be just like the days of Noah when the Lord returned. So looking at the world now, it should give us a very clear indignation of where we're at in prophecy. We could look at Matthew, the 24th chapter, and run all these things down. And I know that some of the things might be over some people's head, but I know y'all know what a war look like. I know y'all know what famine look like. I know y'all know what earthquakes and diverse places look like. So we don't have to be an a, a intellectual person to understand that we're in the end of days. Because that's all you seem to see, and they want to call it global warming. But they don't want to say, God. Is in control. Mm-hmm. They want to say, Mother, what they say, uh, Mother Nature. Mother Nature. Mother Nature. Mother Nature. See, they still don't want to get God the glory. Until that heaven rolled back like a scroll, then they're going to wonder. All right, let's go into Math- Micah. Because we're going to see how long he's been around. So we know that this male keys of that, the same person that was back there with Abraham, was none other than Jesus, who's the same person that was back there with Moses, that followed them in the cloud. And in the sea. So we have constituted the fact that we've only been dealing with one God. Because Jesus himself said, no man hath seen the Father at any time, nor heard his voice. So we've been dealing with Jesus the whole time. And if your God, I mean, if your preacher was sent from God, he would be able to tell you the same thing. This is the information that a preacher search out that was sent from the Lord. These type of points so you don't have to be confused when the Messiah come, and you don't have to be confused about what we are working for. So let's go to Micah, because we're going to find out how long he's been around. Micah 5, pick it up at verse 1. Micah 5 and 1. You can go ahead and read. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. Uh-huh. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. They shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek, because that's what they did when he came in the flesh. They smited him. They pulled his beard out. And they said they shall smite the judge of Israel, because that's what he's going to do in the future. He set forth to put judgment. That's what the Father going to give into his hand. So he said they shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. Go ahead. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah. Uh-huh. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Uh yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. So out of you, Judah, who is your priest nation, out of you, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Go ahead. Whose goings forth have been from old. It's been from what? From old. So this person that's going to be ruler in Israel the same person that came to die for the sins of people, his going forth has been from old. From everlasting. From everlasting. Sisters and brothers, so this 
Jesus has been around when it started the Bible, Scripture, in the beginning. And when it ended, it said, blessed are those that keep his commandments. That's all Jesus. He's been around from old to everlasting. And he came to save the people from their sins. But let's go see what name he came in. Let's go on to Philippians, the second chapter. Because you have a lot of our brothers, Hebrew brothers, say you can't call on the name of Jesus in the English tongue. You got to learn Hebrew, and you got to learn it to call on the name of Jesus. And we're going to find out that that's far from the truth. But they developed a language called Lashawan Kadesh, came out of New York, and this language is supposed to have been a pure language. So they call on Yahweh Shah or your, uh, uh, one of the, another term like Yahweh Shah and Yehoshua. And they don't even have it together, so they argue with each other about the, the name. And this is supposed to be the pure language, right? So one group that's radical will say Yahweh Shah, the other group will say Yehoshua, and then it's like, okay, y'all both call on who? Okay, now we know there ain't nothing pure about that language, right? right. right. Nothing pure. And we're going to see there's nothing wrong with the name of Jesus. Before y'all get out of here, y'all going to fully understand that. But this is the name he came in. Philippians 2, and I'm not even there. Philippians 2 and verse 5. You can go ahead and read when you get there. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, uh -huh. who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So we seen, he said, who being in the form of God, when he was the word, he thought it not robbery to be the equal with God. Go ahead. But made himself of no reputation uh -huh. and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So now everything that we read up until right now coming together, now we understand the mystery. It shouldn't be confusing us anymore. He said, let this man be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation because it wasn't about him. He was trying to point us right back to the Father. He was trying to point us to God. He was God, but he was still just trying to point us to God because we was been to deal with him in the flesh. He had to get this man something physical because we fired him in Samuel. When they, when they was in Samuel, 1 Samuel, they told us, up, oh, make us a God like the other nations. And Samuel turned around and he was salty king, at it. King. Then, then, then he said, make us a king like the other nations. Samuel was salty at it. And then God said, don't be mad at them because they don't reject you. They rejected me. But I'm going to show you the type of God they're going to get. And I want you to run it down to them, the kind of God they're going to get. And that God that they got was Saul. And Saul was not an upright and righteous dude. That's why he did some of the things he did. And got worse and worse toward the end uh, before his death. But see, he was made of no reputation. It took upon him a form of a servant and made into the likeness of men. Go ahead. And being found in fashion as a man, uh -huh. he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Absolutely, because we got these guys out here that think they supermen. But see, when you found in fashion of a man, you got to humble yourself. Because nowadays, they got different things. that They ain't got swords. They got stuff that can touch you a block away. So you got to humble yourself because you run across the wrong person. Who knows what might happen? Death could be the possibility. So that's what God said. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Go ahead. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. So God, the Father, hath highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. So the Father ain't going to give him a name above his name. Keep that in mind. But what name did he get? That at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Uh -huh. Of things in heaven and things in earth. Every and knee's going to bow. At the name of Jesus, at the name that the Father gave him, all knees are going to bow. It say uh, 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 everything in heaven is named after Jesus in Ephesians. So we got this name. It's powerful because it's the Father's name. And he said every knee is going to bow to Jesus, even in the end, the Father and the Son. So now we know what name he came in. Because that's the name that we're going to iron out and let Jesus tell you himself. In John, the fifth chapter. You want that last one? Oh, you didn't hit the last one? Nah. Go ahead. 
And that every tongue should confess uh -huh. that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's right. Every tongue has to confess. I appreciate that. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Because if you don't honor the Son, you can't honor the Father. They come in a package deal. So you got to honor the Son and you got to honor the Father. And that's what the Lord had to read. He said every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I can't understand, even the people who believe in oneness theology, they more likely New Testament Christians, but they don't see two gods right here. If you can't see two gods right here, you blinding the Ray Charles, as <laughs> Brother Bowie would say. Yeah. So now let's see. John 5. Let's see. The Father gave him a name higher than any other name. Let's see what name Jesus came in. I let the cat out the bag. Hope y'all wasn't listening, so we're going to read it anyway. Five, we're going to pick it up at verse 39. St. John 5 and verse 39. When you get there, you go ahead and read. Search the scriptures. Uh-huh. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So he's telling these uh, Pharisees, he says, search the scriptures. Because you think you have eternal life, but y'all ain't paying attention that everything written in the Bible is about me. We just read in the beginning, just rehearsing some of the stuff that was written about him. He created the heaven and the earth. So he's telling them to search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Skip down to verse 43. Go ahead and read, because we're going to see what name he came in. The Father gave him a name, hide in every other name. Verse 33, what does it say? I am come in my Father's name. Yes, sir. And ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So I come in my Father's name, which was Jesus. And you don't receive me, but if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Like John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. He came in the spirit of lies, but he came in his own name. But they, they freely received. They even thought John the Baptist was the Messiah yeah. at, at, at certain points in the scriptures, right? They wanted to tell us plainly who you are. He kept on trying to tell them, I'm coming to pay the way for the Messiah, man. Right. That's not me. Exactly. I, can't, I can't even unloose his shoes, man. So when he come, you're going to know who he is. So he said, search him. I come in my father's name, and you don't even receive me. If you don't take on this name, Jesus, sisters and brothers, you're going to realize before the end of this lesson that you don't get salvation. Let's go ahead. Let's go see his name in Exodus the sixth chapter before he came in the flesh. Because he said he came in his father's name. The father said he gave him a name higher than any other name. That the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's go see what his name was when he was appearing into Moses and them. Let's go see. Exodus, we're going to pick it up six. We're going to pick it up at verse two. Exodus 6, we're going to pick it up at verse 2. Let's see who his name was before he came. Go ahead and read. And God spake unto Moses said, and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of, of God Almighty. Uh -huh. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So he clearly just told Moses, he said, I'm the Lord. But I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by God Almighty. He said, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to him. And the Jehovah's Witnesses don't even know this type of information that's in the Bible, <laughs> that they was dealing with Jesus, Jesus, he's talking about. Right. But they're supposed to be Jehovah's Witnesses. That shows you that they're not witnessing nothing. They're talking about the same thing we opened up with, the doctrine of men. They're teaching for doctrine and commandments of men. They're not teaching people about who God was because he said his name was Jehovah, sisters and brothers. And let's go see the Lord speak about the mouth of Isaiah again in Isaiah the 12th chapter. Because Jehovah, before he came in the flesh, let's go see what Isaiah says about that. Jehovah, before he came in the flesh, Isaiah 12 we're going to grab one script, Isaiah 12, because it's really important for us to really hold on to Jesus, and we're going to see why. Isaiah 12, 
And pick it up at verse 2. Isaiah 12 and 2. Go ahead and read. Behold, God is my salvation. Uh -huh. I will trust and not be afraid. Uh -huh. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. So the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. So before he came in the flesh, we were still under the same administration, right? Bulls and goats. So when is he going to become his salvation? Let's go to Acts the fourth chapter and walk it down. Acts 4. He said, Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Acts 4. Acts 4, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Acts 4, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Taking my time, still see people flipping through the pages. Acts 4, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. You can go ahead. When you go ahead, get there, you can go ahead and read. Acts 4 and 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Because they did not want Jesus being preached because the Pharisees had a hold on the people. And so if you got a hold on people and somebody else come and teach it, it seemed like the same thing that was going on nowadays. You might have had a Baptist church in your block, then the Pentecostals pop up. The Baptists will fight with the Pentecostals, so you don't go over to the Pentecostal church. So that's kind of how it was. It was like we don't want this Jesus to be preached because they're going to start taking away the money that we're getting out of this, out of the people <laughs> yeah. by fleecing them. Yeah. Like the book say, they making merchandise of you, right? So the Pharisees coming to them, and they grieve. Grieve that these brothers were teaching something good. It ain't like they were teaching witchcraft or something like that. They preach through Jesus, the resurrection from okay. the dead. And people in that time and in that geographical location, the area they were in, didn't understand the resurrection. So they didn't understand what they was working for. They were just serving the unknown God. Go ahead. Uh, you skip it? You skip uh, you got my notes. Yeah, skip down to verse 7. Let's go. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? So now they're not interested in the miracle that, that Peter and them had did because they just had uh, healed a man who had been lame from his birth. So they're not interested in that. It ain't like, man, y'all did a great job. We got to believe in that name too. <laughs> right. But they say, man, hold on. When they set him down in the midst, and they said, by what power and by what name have you done this? What did Peter profess? Go ahead. Did I skip down again? Skip uh, down to verse 10. Uh -huh. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So the Peter had boldly came up and said, be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, God has raised from the dead. And that's the power in that name. And that's why this man is standing before you whole, because that name carries weight. Skip down to verse 12, because this is how much weight that name carries. Right. Go ahead. Neither is there salvation in any other. So there is no salvation in any other name but by the name of Jesus, period. If you say you believe the scriptures, you got to believe what the Lord had written in them. Because everybody wants you to believe that you got to call on God in another language. And we're going to iron that out. Because if you do mess up and call on, you call on the wrong God, you can't get the salvation that's set out here for all men. All nations. He said, neither is there salvation in any other name. What, at, what else? Neither is there none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name. So that means Buddha can't save you. That means he had to come in another name. They call him on Jehovah in the old book. But when he came in the flesh, he took on his father's name. So that means that you got to get saved in this Jesus, right? That's the only name that salvation is going to come through. So be it known to you, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be 
saved, sisters and brothers. And God, being that he's omnipotent, he knows things. He knew how it was going to be in his last days. He knew a name he wanted to be called on, too. He gave us another sign. And praise God for that. So we can iron out all of the Yawasha lives and the Yawali <laughs> lives and all those words yeah. that I can't even pronounce. Because <laughs> I've definitely got a stammer and lip another tongue. Let's go see the name and the sign that he did give us. Let's go to Malachi, the first chapter. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to the evidence. Because God wants to save us. But we have to pay attention to the evidence. If he got the evidence on the table, just take it and have faith. Because the only thing you can stand before him and say is, God, I had faith. I was in captivity. They gave me a book full of English. I didn't know Hebrew, so I called your name in the land of my captivity. How you gonna hold that? How you gonna hold me accountable for that? I'm calling on you in the name that was given to me, and I read it, and it all tied together that by your name salvation comes. The name that was given to me was Jesus, and this is how I know that this name is absolute. Malachi, the first chapter, pick it up at verse six. Malachi, one. Pick it up at verse 6. When you get there, you can go ahead and read. A son honor, honoreth his father, uh-huh. and a servant his master. Uh-huh. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? That's right. And if I be a master, where is my fear? That's why the Lord said in Isaiah, the, uh, the, the seventh chapter, that he said, I mean, ninth chapter, that he was the father, the everlasting father, because he is our father. He said, if then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master... Where is my fear? Y'all feel the people that's holding th- themselves to a certain uh, level over you? The man in the street, the person with the badge, y'all feel them, but y'all won't feel me? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm, I'm give you something clear, some evidence that you can see who named the call along. Verse 11. Uh, from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. He said, from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, his name shall be great among the Gentiles, sisters and brothers. And it's obvious. What do the Gentiles call on on every edge of the earth? Jesus. Jesus. I've never heard a Gentile what we would call white people say Yahawashah, ever. <laughs> I've never heard it in a movie. I've never heard it <laughs> in the streets. No. They don't call on Yahweh Shah, they call on Jesus. That's how you know that name is absolute. And he gave us that as a sign in our days so we won't get confused about it. And let these Hebrews twist us and say, you got to learn how to speak Hebrew to call on the name of God. Because Gentiles don't call on Yahweh Shah. No. And what else did he say? And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name in uh-huh. a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. He even hit you with a big one. He said, my name going to be great among the nations. So not only are we going to get the Gentiles to say my name, we're going to get the Hamites to say my name. Everybody call on the name of Jesus. Don't nobody call on Yahweh Shah. No. I wonder why and where they got that from. You know what that is? That's the modern day Pharisees. They're trying to keep people in the dark. That's trying to stop people from teaching and healing and bringing salvation to the nations in the name of Jesus. It's just that simple. And the Lord gave us the evidence right there. And they keep overlooking it because of their pride, because they don't want nobody else to be saved because of what happened to us. But what happened to us wasn't the white man's fault. Right. It was our fault. We turned our backs on God, and now we're going to blame the bat from hitting us. <laughs> How you going to blame the bat? You better point to the swinger and say, man, can you stop hitting me? Yeah. You know, the bat ain't doing nothing but just, I, you know, I don't understand it. We got to get that together. And see, we can understand more as we walked all that information down. Now that we understand who God was. And why he came, we can understand the prayer that he gave to the Father. Let's go to John, the 17th chapter. Let's go to John 17. I apologize for these allergies whooping me, y'all. So my brother took care of me with the, uh, 
And the crazy thing is, I'm trying to get here, and I'm popping the, uh, I'm trying to get a clarity, and I broke the thing open, it popped and went somewhere <laughs> else. <laughs> and I was like, dang, man, ain't this something? That's okay. I'm almost through. I'm not too far from the end. We got about two more script, three more scriptures counting this one. John 17, and we can understand now, after going through all of that, the prayer that Jesus is going to give to the Father. Go ahead. John 17 and 1, 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Uh huh. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's right. So as many as call on my name, Father, you gave me power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And the people that the, fa the Father is drawing to Jesus is all those that got their ears on. And the Lord said, my sheep going to hear my voice. And now you just got to listen. You got to pay attention to the scriptures. And you got to let the Lord lead you. And he will. I'm telling you, I came out of darkness. I'm pretty sure all of us came out of a, a place in our lives that we are ashamed of. But the Lord, I, was, I had enough understanding to just listen. And I did. And look where we're at now. I'm before you guys, you beautiful brothers and sisters. And I'm blessed to be able to stand before y'all knowing that this is the Lord's Sabbath day. That's a blessing. So he said, as thou given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many that shall, that as many as thou hast given him. Verse 3. And this is life eternal. Uh-huh. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's two gods. It's, we didn't, we didn't, I can make a lesson just on that part right there, proving that point. It's two gods. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God. That's why Jesus came in his Father's name. And Jesus Christ, which means the anointed one, whom thou hast sent. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I came to my own. I came to earth. Uh huh. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to I do. I told them about you. Go ahead. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So before any beginning ever even happened, Jesus is asking the Father to give me back that glory that I had with you before the world was. Sisters and brothers, we can't sum it up. <laughs>